Good morning. We're going to, since this is Lutheran Schools Week, we're going to approach our sermon uh, from a kind of a model school day approach. And since we're going to take that model school day approach, you need to get your textbooks out. That would be the Bible. There's one in front of you. Now, I know that some of you, you know, you prefer the crib notes. You never read the book like the teacher asked you to. You just took the crib notes. So if you don't want to get the Bible, I'll get your crib notes out. That's the bulletin because it has the same lesson in it. Look at the epistle lesson there, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 10 through 18. That'll be the basis of our school day today. And Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you, what I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. So our lesson for this day is around that first verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul is going to say to us as students, there should be no divisions among you. No divisions. But that we should be united in mind and in thought. Now that's kind of a big, broad subject to deal with, so let's take it down. Let's look at a theme, if you will, a theme out of this lesson, and we're going to take that theme down to two key words. And those two key words are schizophrenia and purpose. Now I know right about now you're going, where in the world is he going with schizophrenia and Lutheran schools? I'll get you there, I hope, okay? But I want you to walk out of here today with an understanding how these two things are opposed one to another. And how God's way to deal with not the legitimate mental illness, but perhaps the uh, lesser manifestations of schizophrenia in our lives, marriages, families, and congregations. How God would deal with that by instilling a sense of purpose into our lives and into our relationships. So if we're going to deal with these two opposing realities, then uh, let's start out with history. Uh, we're going to start with history because I'm a teacher and I get to decide where we start. Besides that, history is my favorite subject. That was my major in college and you know, too bad. That's where we're starting. For those of you who like math, there's no math in today's lesson. Okay? I'm not good at math. We're not going there. But I want you to answer this question. I'm going to name some historical figures. Uh, some uh, passed away. Some are still living. But I want you to tell me what do these people have in common? The first person is Mary Todd Lincoln, who was, of course, married to President Abraham Lincoln. The second person is a famous artist, if you're a student of art, Vincent Van Gogh. The third person, uh, you would need to be a fan of Nobel Prizes, and in particular a Nobel Prize in economics, and you might know John Nash. The fourth person, is a Hall of Fame member of the Green Bay Packers. Now, I know we're all Bear fans, but, you know, i got to fit into the lesson today. Lionel Aldridge, Hall of Fame player for the Green Bay Packers. 
And then let's step into popular culture. Let's talk about a mammoth rock and roll group. Let's talk about the Beach Boys. Let's talk about one of their founding members. Let's talk about Brian Wilson. So what do Mary Todd Lincoln and Vincent Van Gogh and John Nash and Lionel Aldridge and Brian Wilson, what do they all have in common? Well, they're all famous. They all were significant. They all had a great amount of influence on their day and their time and their culture. They influenced lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of lives. But the real thing that they all have in common is they were all struggling with schizophrenia. And while Nash can come up with economic theory that confounds the world, he's so brilliant, and Brian Wilson can write songs that'll move a whole culture, Vincent Van Gogh can create artwork that we all step back and just go, wow. Every one of these people struggled in their personal life, and every one of these people struggled in their marriages. Every one of these people struggled in their personal relationships with other people because schizophrenia is always destructive. It always makes life difficult. And it always makes any relationship you're in difficult, if not, according to some of their own testimonies, almost impossible. Paul says, no divisions. No divisions. Unity in mind and thought. Now to apply that and make this now hopefully make some connection, let's move from history to language arts. And when you move to language arts, a big part of language arts is always vocabulary. And so let's understand what schizophrenia is all about because it is in the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. It comes from two words which have their origin in Greek, schizmata, which means to be divided, which means to be torn apart, uh, which means to be ripped up. And phrenia is the word for your mind, your ability to think, your ability to reason. So schizophrenia is the fact that the mind is torn. It's ripped up, if you will. It's divided because there's all these voices that are speaking to me. There's all these voices that are making demands of me and my time and my energy. There's all these voices telling me, I need to do this. No, I need to do that. No, I need to be over here. No, I need to be over there. And how do I decide which of those voices is reality? How do I decide which ones I should listen to and which ones I should ignore? And struggling to make those decisions and frequently making the wrong decisions is what brings such pain and misery and destructive realities to all the relationships around me. Schizmata. To divide, to tear, to rip up. Paul said, no divisions, no torn, no ripped up, no divided, be unified. Ever had a schizmata moment in your marriage? Now you think this is what you ought to be doing and your spouse thinks this is what you ought to be doing. And now there's not a unified voice in your marriage. There's two voices in your marriage. Which voice are you going to listen to? Uh, is it a simple matter of, well, we went your way last time, so now it's my turn? Uh, is it the reality of, well, I'm right more often than you are, so let's listen to me? That one's not going to work too well, is it? You ever have those moments in your marriage? where you've lost your unity, your two divided voices, two divided people, and your relationship is not being strengthened in this moment. It's not growing deeper in this moment. It's drifting apart. No divisions, Paul said. On Lutheran Schools Week, how many of us are blessed to be parents? Raise your hand. Do it boldly. Come on. Don't be ashamed. You brought them into the world. <laughs> if you have children, then you know you have schizmata. You've experienced schizmata. It goes like this. I'm the father, and God has made me the head of this household. That's biblical. And so I am the authority in this home, and God is asking you to respect that authority. There is a fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Listen to us. We're older, we're wiser, and hopefully we can guide and direct your life. However, every child knows that's baloney. You don't know anything. You don't understand. You don't get it. 
and you need to listen to me. I'm the voice of wisdom. And now we have multiple voices in the home, don't we? We have schizmata. There's mom's voice, there's dad's voice, and then however many kids you have. You might have three, four, five, six, seven voices in this relationship. And which one gets listened to? And who gets ignored? And how do you make those decisions? And what are the consequences of those decisions? Will you always listen to her? Will you always do what he wants to do? Will you always go in his direction? And now we have divisiveness and brokenness. And schizmata is always destructive. It never builds up. It always tears down. We have schizmata in the church. I think we ought to be doing this. No, we ought to be doing that. Well, we shouldn't go there. No, we really ought to go there. Well, I think this is really what's important. No, no, no. you got to understand this is what we ought to be doing. And we have lots and lots and lots of voices. Who do we listen to? How do we decide? Who gets ignored, left behind? Schizmata is always destructive. Paul understood that because he saw it in the life of the Corinthian congregation. He can't get out of chapter 1 without dealing with the schizmata in their life, the divisions, the tornness, the, the realities that separated them into little groups. In chapter 1, it deals with the issue of baptism. And there are people running around the congregation going, <laughs> I was baptized by Peter. Who were you baptized by? Oh, Paul. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. I, I, you know, Peter didn't have time to baptize everybody, so he just picked the special people. He picked the important people. He picked the people that he wanted to make significant uh, in the congregation. I just happened to be baptized by Peter. You know, Paul's a good guy. Yeah, he's a good missionary. Really good preacher. Yeah, you know, he's got a heart of gold. I really like the guy. He picked up the rest uh, that Peter couldn't. And so this arrogance over who actually poured water on me in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit began to divide and began to destroy the congregation in Corinth. We can get a few chapters uh, farther <clears throat> into the letter and we're going to be divided over moral choices. And some of us are going to say, hey, that's wrong. You can't do that. And some of us are going to say, oh, it's not that big a deal. Let it go. Just relax. And some are going, well, this shouldn't even be in our congregation. And some are going to say, oh, don't be so judgmental. It's right. It's wrong. It shouldn't be. It's okay. Kick him out. Ignore it. And there's all these different voices over moral choices. There's schizmata in the body of Christ. There's not unity. We get a little farther into the book, and they're arguing over spiritual gifts. I have this gift. This is the really most important gift. This is the special gift. You know, the Peter baptized people who've been called out and made special. We have this gift. The riffraff, uh, the rest of you, you have other gifts. Schizmata. And Paul sees how it destroys, and it breaks down, and it disrupts, and it never builds up. Schizophrenics are usually put on a continuum. There are two extremes in the illness. On the one extreme, it's called catatonic schizophrenia. And on the other end of the continuum, it's called catatonic excitement. In catatonic schizophrenia, there are so many voices all screaming at you, all demanding, all commanding of you, all saying, you got to give me your attention. you got to listen to me. We've got to do it my way. And they yak and they yak and they yak and they yak and they yak. And the person doesn't know what to do because who do I listen to? Who do I not listen to? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I do this? Do that? And in all of those demanding realities, they become paralyzed, sometimes literally, physically paralyzed. They don't, can't move. Too many demands. How many of you are blessed in here to be a mom? Know what I'm talking about? Your husband wants this, he wants this, he wants this, he wants this. The kids, each kid, this kid wants this, this kid wants this, this one wants this, this one wants this. You got to do the laundry, you got to clean the house, you got to make the meals, you got to do this, you got to do that. And sometimes there are just so many things, so many voices, so many demands. You just want to yell and scream, you just want to, you know, plop down on the bed 
You feel paralyzed. There's nothing I can do to keep you all happy. Not just unique to moms. Dads have the same reality. Kids have the same reality. Churches have the same reality. So many demands. So many voices. So many needs. How in the world do we meet them all? No schismata, Paul said. Unity. But on the other end is catatonic excitement, and that means that there's all these voices out there screaming and yelling and demanding and telling me what they need and what they want, and I try to make them all happy. I try to do it all. And so I'm running around doing, 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 doing. And those of us who are outside the disease begin to notice that you are just in a frenzy of activity. But usually, the important things of life are being neglected. And so we notice you're not eating. Or you're not sleeping. Or you're not taking care of basic hygiene. And so in your marriage, you're doing and 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 doing, trying to make her happy, trying to make him happy. But what would really make him or her happy, what would really bring meaning and significance and depth to your marriage, you never get to it because you're so consumed in all these petty little needs. You're running hither and yon, you're buying this and you're buying that, you're in participating in this and 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 this for your kids, but they don't know you and you don't know them. There's no real depth to your relationship with your children because your life is filled with activity. What they need most is you, what they have least of is you. You ever walk into a congregation or go online and see this list after list after list after list after list of all these ministries that they have and you just you're like wow what in the world's wrong with St. Paul our list isn't anywhere half that long how in the world are they doing all those things striving so hard to meet everybody's needs and keep everybody happy they just seem to be so much more effective at doing that than we do but is anybody growing in Christ? In all that activity, in all those ministries, is anybody coming to Christ? Coming to faith? Catatonic excitement. We're so busy doing, 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 that the important things don't get done. Paul said, no, 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 no. No more schismata. Unity. So let's get out of language arts, let's go off here to social studies, and let's realize that in social studies, every individual, every organization, when groups of people come together, we call that marriage, we call that family, we call that ministry, we call that a country, whenever these groups come together, they need purpose. They need to know why did we come together? Why do we get married? Why do we have kids? Why do we join this congregation? Why do we create a congregation? Why did we begin a school ministry? We need purpose. The New International Version translates 1 Corinthians uh, 1.10 by having Paul say that we need to be united in mind and in thought. Thought's a lousy translation of that word. The word really refers not to thought. Paul isn't saying we need to have unity of thought. We don't all have to like the same TV shows. We don't all have to root for the same teams. We don't all have to like the same foods. Uh, what Paul says there is that there needs to be unity in mind and in purpose. In our marriages, in our families, in our congregation, in our country, we need to understand what's our purpose. Why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing? And the word has that sense of to know, but to know with absolute certainty, to have no doubt, to be convinced with a passion that this is my purpose. This is why I'm in this relationship. This is why I belong to this organization. And when we all agree on why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing, uh, the schizmata diminishes and diminishes and diminishes and diminishes. 
We don't listen to all those voices. We listen to a singular voice, the voice of purpose. Why do we have Lutheran schools? Diane pointed out, you know, this is our 149th year. Why did we create a Lutheran school 149 years ago? Now, despite the rumors, I wasn't here then. Um, so truth be told, I don't know what they were thinking 149 years ago. I'll tell you why I think we have Lutheran schools today. And I can tell you why in two words. Brady and Bella. They are my grandchildren. Did you all notice that cute little boy who led the parade right up here? Wasn't he just adorable? Come on, he was the best looking one up here. That's Brady. Brady is growing up in a world with a lot of voices. They're all screaming at him. They're all trying to convince him. They're all trying to tempt him. They're all telling him that they're right and he needs to listen to them and he needs to do it that way. There's a culture that's telling him he needs to be successful. And there's a God who tells him he needs to be significant. And they are not one and the same thing. There's a culture that tells him, Brady, as you grow up, and you're thinking about what you want to do with your life, you need to think about how much money are you going to make. Choose a profession where you'll make a lot of money. Because if you make a lot of money, you can do a lot of things. You can buy a lot of things. You can experience. You can go. You can have. So money is really important and crucial in this decision-making process. And there's a voice from Calvary that says, deny yourself. Sacrifice. And serve. Those aren't the same voices. And there are voices saying, Brady, do this, and Bella, do that, and Brady, do this, and Bella, do that, and Brady, do this, and Bella, do that. And there is a voice from Calvary saying, no, do this, and do this. And unfortunately and tragically in the world in which they're growing up, these two voices are increasingly separate and distinct. No schismata, unity, a single voice. I want my grandchildren to hear the voice of Jesus. I can do so much at home, I can and I will, but I can also immerse them in a world five days a week where they will learn all the skills that they need to learn, all the knowledge that they need to have, all the things to prepare them to be responsible uh, in this world and to be successful in this world. But I can put them in a world where five days a week I am training them, not just at home, not just on Sunday, but Monday through Friday to listen to a single voice, the voice of Jesus to arrange their life around the purpose for which he has redeemed them, forgiven them, saved them, gifted them, and empowered them. That they learn to listen to these other voices and say, no, no, no. I follow him. No schizmata. Just purpose. Not just any purpose, but his purpose. That to me is why I will send my grandchildren to Lutheran schools. Now on the end of the outline it talks about marriage. So our last subject of the day is health. I'll end with health. When I was getting ready and preparing for this sermon, I, I turned to my wife, Lynn, and I said, Lynn, why did you marry me? The look she gave me back was not healthy for me, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, it was kind of like, what? Uh, we've been together almost 35 years, and, you know, you're not certain. So I, I explained to her, no, this is 
this is for the sermon. Uh, I'm getting ready. I'm going to talk about this in the sermon. Uh, and so, so she got it. And, and I said, okay, Lynn, why did you marry me? And she said, because I love you. And very quickly she said, okay, Danny, why did you marry me? And I said, because I love you. Now, do we need any more purpose statement than that? I don't think so. You know, we have these moments, uh, these schizophrenic moments uh, in our marriage where uh, I have one opinion and she has another. Uh, anybody say amen? <laughs> and of course, I'm always right, right? Let's all say amen, because, you know, if I wasn't right, I wouldn't be having this argument, you know? But this is schizmata. This is destructive. This isn't good. There's nothing productive about this at all. We need unity. And so why don't I sit down and approach this issue from this perspective? How do I love Lynn? What decision could I make here? What actions could I take here that will let Lynn know I love her more and more and more? And hopefully she's asking herself the same thing. What decisions could I make here that will help Danny know I love him more and more and more? We don't need any more purpose statements than that. That's the reason we came together. We loved each other and we wanted to love each other the rest of our lives. Are we doing that? Well, that's our purpose. If the answer is no, then let's change course. If the answer is yes, then let's stay the course. Why did we come together as a congregation? I think it's to love the one who first loved us. To say to him by our decisions and by our actions, Jesus, we love you. Because we've seen how much you love us. You know, it's much harder in marriage uh, to love than it is in the church because, you know, uh, there is no one-size-fits-all wife. Uh, there isn't one-size-fits-all marriage. There's no one perfect way to love every woman. You're all unique. You're all special. And praise God for that. And I've been trying for 34 years to learn how to love this woman how to better love her, how to best love her. She's growing, she's changing, I'm growing, I'm changing, and so life is always changing somewhat, and I have to learn and readjust and figure out new ways and new things. It's hard work. It's not that hard to love Jesus because he tells you exactly how to do that in a one-size-fits-all kind of way. He wants the same things from everyone who loves him. And you don't have to try and figure that out. Uh, he wrote it down. He put it in a book. All you got to do is read it. No more schizmata. Unity. By coming together around a common purpose that's spelled out clearly, specifically, in the book. So your homework is read the book. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we repent of all the tornness, all the divisiveness, all the ripping that's gone on in our lives and in our relationships. The scars of our schizmata are everywhere. But today, in the power of Jesus Christ, we turn to a new way of life. We come together as husband and wife, as mother and father, as parent and child, as brothers and sisters, as members of this congregation and community, and we unite in purpose. We understand why we are here and what voice we need to listen to. There's only one. And that's yours. So as Vicar said, sometimes it's hard for us to pay attention. It's hard for us to focus. And it's hard for us to concentrate. But it is not hard for you to overcome that. Speak to us clearly. Help us to listen. Strengthen us to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.